I've chosen for my title for today's talk to revisit the thesis put forward by Francis Fukuyama that our last speaker referred to about the end of the Cold War leading to the triumph of liberal democracy, which he called the end of history. Okay, that's gonna be one of my themes, but I also would like to uh, give some very uh, personal observations about the Berlin Wall and the Cold War and its consequences for today, uh, partly because I lived here in Berlin in the 1980s and experienced a lot of what it's like to live, at least, I was on the west side at least, uh, but to live in a city with the Berlin Wall. And my children went to the John F. Kennedy School here in Berlin and uh, grew up with this experience. So I do have some very personal um, experience of it. Uh, I know many of the current university students, many of the current generation were born after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War. And for you, it's ancient history, which you haven't experienced. I mean, it's not part of the world of the internet or smartphones or social media. And when we think about global conflict today, it's mostly about the Middle East and not Europe. Um, Today, the EU has 27 member states, but it's, and it's difficult to imagine that Europe was divided by an Iron Curtain, whereas today, it's been drawn together by the EU. Uh, but let's imagine for a minute that it's 1981, and General Jaroszelski has just declared martial law in Poland. Now, if anyone would have predicted at that point that in 10 years, the Soviet Union would no longer exist, and that Poland would join the European Union and NATO, it certainly would have seemed like delusional fantasy. And yet it has happened. And the fall of the Berlin Wall has come to symbolize this dramatic change in Europe. I'm American and I, growing up in the United States in the 1950s and 1960s, the Cold War was very much a part of my childhood. I remember drills in the grade school where we were trained what to do in case of a nuclear attack. Uh, and I remember the bomb shelters that many of my neighbors built in their basements to protect themselves. I very vividly remember watching the TV news on August 13th, 1961, and seeing the reports uh, by Walter Cronkite, the uh, sage of American journalism, reporting about the building of a wall in Berlin, which, uh, which just re prior to that, the leaders of the East Germany, the German Democratic Republic, said they would never build a wall. So there was a lot of astonishment. I also remember the following year, President Kennedy on television announcing a blockade of Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so I grew up and my generation grew up with the threat of nuclear annihilation hanging over us and the view of a bipolar world divided between totalitarian communism of the Soviet Union and the liberal democracy of the West. Okay. The dominant view in the West was that the Soviet Union was bent on world domination, as epitomized by Nikita Khrushchev's famous speech at the UN when he banged his shoe on the podium and said, we will bury you. And after all, the Marxist ideology that the Soviets embraced claimed that socialism and communism would inevitably triumph over capitalism as a result of the scientific laws of historical development. The Soviet Union considered itself, the, the leaders of the Soviet Union considered themselves to be the embodiment of this ideology and their, it's ex, the Soviet Union's expansion first into Eastern and Central Europe after World War II and then into Asia and China and North Korea seemed to indicate that the, what the communist leaders believed that Marxism justified their continued expansionism. And as they believed history was on their side, they did not have to be impatient and force the pace of change. They could take their time and engage in a long-term struggle for domination. This, is, this was the Cold War. At the very start of the Cold War, an American diplomat named George Kennan proposed the Western response to Soviet expansionism in his policy of containment, which he also warned would require patient, long-term vigilance on the part of the West to blunt the advance of communism and eventually lead to the mellowing of its militancy or to its internal decay. Communist, uh, containment meant that the West would have to accept the existence of communist regimes where they had been established, but try to prevent other countries from falling to communism. 
That was the basis of the domino theory that President Eisenhower articulated as justification for U.S. involvement in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. After the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the world seemed on the brink of nuclear war, both sides seemed to tacitly agree on a policy of, of nuclear deterrence, which was exemplified by the term mutual assured destruction, that neither side would launch a nuclear attack because it would only result in their own destruction as well. But there was always the threat that conventional military confrontations could spiral out of control and lead to a nuclear exchange. Well, such confrontations in Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, or the Middle East contain this threat. They did not endanger the core interests of either side. Only a conflict in Europe would do that, as both sides had large conventional military forces stationed on the European continent. That's why the West did not use its military force to assist popular uprising against communist rule in East Germany in 1953 or in Hungary in 1956, or in Czechoslovakia in 1968, or the Solidarity Movement in Poland in, uh, when martial law was declared in 1981. It's also why the West did not move against the building of the Berlin Wall in 1961. Because the Berlin Wall, in fact, achieved its goal of stabilizing the East German regime, which was hemorrhaging people who were fleeing the country, and that there was a danger the whole country would fall apart by stopping people from fleeing, by preventing people from leaving, the East German regime was stabilized. And in, and in a certain kind of distorted way, this helped maintain the balance of power in Europe and the peace of Europe. Because if the East German regime, if the German Democratic Republic had collapsed in 1961, there could very, very well have been a direct military confrontation between Soviet and US forces right here in this city and, through, and in Germany as a whole. Uh, which could have easily spiraled into a nuclear confrontation. It's unfortunate that if this view is correct, then the peace of Europe for much of the Cold War was bought at the expense of the freedom of the East German people. Let's fast forward, though, to, to 1989, 28 years later. Why was it possible for the Berlin Wall to be challenged at this point, but not challenged in 1961? Well, the simple answer is that the changed circumstances of 1989, a stable East German regime was no longer necessary to maintain the peace of Europe. And the Soviet Union under Gorbachev was no longer willing to intervene to maintain that regime. Of course, there's also the larger context of the collapse of the Soviet system. I mentioned Mr. Khrushchev. In 1960, he made a, another one of his famous speeches in which he said that communism was going to be such a success that, that, that the Soviet Union would, the economy would catch up and surpass that of the United States by 1980. Well, in a certain sense he was right. They were probably producing in 1980 what the United States produced in 1960. But by the 1980s, the U.S. had moved and the U.S. economy had moved uh, very much forward. Way, and the Soviet Union was falling further and further behind. All right, we're used to the internet, to smartphones, and uh, the social media today, but the computer revolution that was really beginning in the 1980s was in many ways the key to the competition between the Soviet Union and the West. Because with the, this broader scientific technological revolution that the West was experiencing, uh, the economy of the West and the abilities of the West were increasing quite rapidly. Uh, but the Soviet leaders did not want to put computers in the hands of their people. They were afraid that the access to information would undermine their own authority, their own, because it was their monopoly of information and knowledge that helped them maintain their uh, power. And with the U.S. economy growing, and opening up all these sources of information and knowledge, uh, this was the, the real key to the competition between the West and the Soviet Union. For the Soviet leaders, if they didn't, if they, if they didn't open up these technologies to their population, then their economy could not grow. On the other hand, if they did open them up, then they risked being overthrown. All right, the 
the gerontocracy that ruled the Soviet Union at the early 1980s, Mr. Brezhnev, Mr. Andropov, Mr. Chernyenko, they didn't have the vision or understanding of how the world had changed around them. So it fell to Mikhail Gorbachev when he came to power in 1985 to try to renovate the Soviet system. This is the meaning of his perestroika and glasnost policies. Uh, it's interesting to note uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who wrote, Frenchman who wrote in the 19th century about the French Revolution. Uh, he wrote that the most dangerous time for an autocratic system is when it begins to reform itself. Why? Because the time that, by the time that the autocrats realize that reform is needed, it's already too late. All right, that people want more than the reforms than they're willing to grant. And it only leads, any reform just leads to greater demands from the population, which is exactly what happened in the Soviet Union and also all the former satellite states. But Mr. Gorbachev was very popular and he did have the image of being a progressive modern Soviet leader. It was interesting, I was in the audience here in Berlin in 1987 when the American president Ronald Reagan came and stood on a podium in front of the Brandenburg Gate along with West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl and President Richard von Weizsäcker and he challenged Gorbachev to tear down this wall, he said, to demonstrate that he was really serious about reform. And Reagan's supporters to this day claim he's the person responsible for the fall of the Berlin Wall. All right, that they claim that his strategic defense initiative or Star Wars project and the installation of intermediate range nuclear missiles in Europe forced the Soviet Union into an arms race in which it just could not afford to compete. That's why uh, Mikhail Gorbachev had to try to bring about some kind of reform within the Soviet system. Okay, others obviously will credit Gorbachev himself for bringing down the Berlin Wall because of, of his refusal to provide Soviet military power to crush the popular demonstrations in the streets of East Germany's cities against Erich Honecker's rule. But, I mean, the bottom line, it was the people of East, East Germany themselves who brought down the wall in 1989 by fleeing across the Hungarian border to Austria when the Hungarians opened their border there by storming the trains that were leaving the country, by demonstrating in the streets of Leipzig and East Berlin and other cities, and then on that fateful night of November 9th, 1989, of pushing the guards to open the wall uh, after the botched press conference of the member of the East German uh, Politburo, Mr. Schabowski, uh, where he inadvertently said that people would be able to travel. He didn't... Uh, uh, there's an interesting story about who is, who is responsible for what happened that night. And certainly the, the mistake of, of Mr. Schabowski in his press conference and how that was spread uh, throughout the city of Berlin was a major factor. I mean, one thing about November 9th, 1989, and the entire process of the end of communist rule in Central and Eastern Europe uh, is that all of this happened without much violence, which is truly remarkable. And it's little wonder then to get to Francis Fukuyama and the end of history, why Mr. Fukuyama would say at the end of the Cold War, why this was a triumph, not just of the West, but the triumph of liberal democracy over communism. He said, the end of his, this is the end of history as such, the end of mankind's ideological evolution. He argued that liberal, Western liberal democracy was the final form of human government, and the future would consist of its continuous expansion to more and more countries around the world. While his view was briefly popularized and used to triumph, trumpet the triumph of the West, Fukuyama was roundly criticized for failing to take into consideration the return of history in the form of nationalism and fundamentalist religion, as we saw in the ex-Yugoslavia wars of the 1990s and the rise of Islamist terrorism, a la Al-Qaeda and its successors since 2001. Nonetheless, the political evolution of Poland, the Czech Republic, the Baltic states, the incorporation of East Germany into the Federal Republic, uh, all of these support Fukuyama's thesis, as does the democratic evolution of countries which were previously ruled by dictatorships in Asia, such as Taiwan, South Korea and the Philippines, 
as well as many Latin American countries. Even the recent early phases of the Arab Spring in 2011 appeared to be dislodging dictatorships in favor of democratically elected governments. Though, obviously, the current events in Libya, Syria, and Iraq are really not encouraging on this account, to say the least. In contrast to Fukuyama, there was another 1990s prof uh, professor and theorist who argued that the end of the Cold War would lead to a new set of global conflicts based on culture, which he called the clash of civilizations. This, of course, is Samuel Huntington. He analyzed eight different such conflicts, the largest one being the conflict between Islamic and Western civilizations. Though the current conflict within Islam between extremist Sunni and Shia groups seems to have trumped the conflict with the West, at least for the time being. Interestingly, Huntington took note almost 20 years ago of the potential conflict in Ukraine between the Catholic West and the Orthodox East. So who was right, Fukama, Fukuyama or Huntington? Well, there's evidence obviously pointing in both directions. More democracy and impetus towards democracy in many parts of the world today. Hong Kong comes to mind as the most current example. And there's obviously a lot more conflict that uh, our previous speaker referred to in Ukraine and the Middle East, uh, which is also very discouraging. Uh, in fact, it seems at the moment that the forces, we, we might call the forces of disorder, Thomas Freeman in one of his recent columns uh, looked at the events in Ukraine, Libya, Syria, Gaza, the rise of ISIS, the attempts of the Kurds uh, to unite. He, he, he referred to all these various forces, Boko Haram and Nigeria, uh, as the forces of disorder in the world. And it seems that they certainly are, are growing, all right? And the, the effort to extinguish such forces is complicated by, obviously, the conflicting interests of what you might call the forces of order. I mean, just to give an example, we see in uh, the conflict with ISIS the differences between Turkey and the United States. Uh, they each have different objectives and different understanding of what the priority is there. All right, likewise, clearly the conflict with, that Russia is having with the West today uh, over Ukraine and uh, especially Crimea, but also the current events in eastern Ukraine, uh, these are things that are uh, not going to be solved easily, but at the same time, Russia needs the West in many ways to, to help in other areas, and Russia, for its part, needs the West although uh, it seems that Mr. Putin is moving uh, away from that kind of thinking. But I, don't, I doubt if, in the long run, that, uh, that we'll see the emergence of a new Cold War. Um, but um, in this regard, I mean, the bipolar war, world of the Cold War may seem like a, a, a fond memory. It was simple. It was, in some sense, orderly compared to the messy and, much, and apparently more dangerous world that we live in today, which is a, a multipolar world characterized by chaos and anarchy, represented by failed states and entrenched terrorist organizations. Okay, today we seem to be facing a, a kind of a Hobbesian war of each against all in a multipolar, multipolar conflict where today's potential allies may be tomorrow's enemies. All right, that's why the United States, for example, is reluctant to get involved in Syria's civil war or put troops back on the ground in Iraq. If the Cold War was less complicated than today's world, the West also had a strategy in the Cold War for how to achieve its goals, containment. This was a strategy, excuse me, a strategy that was applied for 40 years before it finally achieved its objective. What is further disconcerting about our contemporary world is that it's not clear what the strategy of the West is for defeating or neutralizing the forces of disorder. Bombing raids on ISIS or supplying arms to those fighting ISIS is a tactic. It's not a strategy. My own view, which I've already heard from the previous two speakers, has to do with education as a long-term strategy. What's needed, again, one of our previous speakers mentioned, 
There's an attempt to win the hearts and minds of the dispossessed and, uh, if, and the disenchanted young people throughout the world. And if the West is not willing to compete on that level, then we're in serious trouble because that's the most important level. The, the forces of disorder, as uh, we can call them, wouldn't have recruits if, we could, if they felt that they had a future in their societies. All right, this means helping young people to develop the skills, the attitudes, and the habits they will need to succeed in our competitive global society, giving them the means to earn a living and raise a family of their own so they feel they have a stake in society, so they see a constructive path into the future. Educational institutions clearly have an important role to play in this process, but I don't want to put all the pressure on the educational institutions to uh, solve the world's problems because education can't work unless it, it's in the context of a society where there's a stable legal order with a fair and transparent legal structure, a stable economy, appropriate social welfare institutions, and appropriate role models for the young. But certainly education is key, and that's something we here uh, can make it, have an impact on. Let me conclude with some observations on the impact of the fall of the Berlin Wall on today's world. Certainly the, wall has a, the fall of the wall has a huge symbolic meaning. It symbolizes not only the end of the Cold War, the end of communism as a political reality in Europe, the end of Russian domination of Central Europe, but also the triumph of human freedom over the forces of oppression. I want to comment on each of these symbolic meanings. The end of the Cold War not only means the end of the communist form of rule in Europe, it also means the end of one of the most powerful ideologies of the 20th century. Many of Europe's intellectuals were attracted to the utopian and social justice ideals of communism and overlooked its oppressive realities because the communists represented to them a continuation of Europe's revolutionary traditions of, the, of siding with the poor and the, and the downtrodden against their oppressors. Okay, but for the moment, this is largely passe. I think the bankruptcy of communism as an oppositional ideology has opened up the path for nationalism and fundamentalist religion to capture the hearts and minds of those who feel left out or excluded by modernity in its current form of globalization and technological revolution. Okay, this is, I find, very interesting portrayed interestingly portrayed by the Turkish writer Orhan Pamuk in his novel Snow. The same characters he uh, describes who in the 1970s looked to communism as the solution to their country's problem are looking to Islamist ideology by the beginning of the 21st century. And uh, that's, I think, certainly a, an indication that uh, the secular ideologies of, of national, well, particularly of socialism, uh, are no longer, and communism especially, are no longer uh, something that is capturing the imagination of the young people. The, Berlin, the fall of the Berlin Wall is also more broadly associated with the fall of the Russian Empire, and not just the fall of the Soviet Union, because the breakup of the Soviet Union resulted in the loss of control by Moscow of huge territories that were previously ruled by Russia's czars, whether in Central Asia, the Caucasus, Eastern Europe, or the Baltics. Many ethnic Russians moved to these territories and their descendants live there to this day. Mr. Putin has made clear that he does not respect the territorial integrity of the other successor states that were once part of the Soviet Union. What are his ultimate goals in the Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, and beyond? Is he trying to restore that Russian empire that collapsed after the fall of the wall? And how far is he willing to go? All right, my last observation is uh, from the German writer Peter Schneider. The, he wrote a famous novel, a novella about the Berlin Wall called The Wall Jumper. And in that work, he says that the walls in our head will be harder to break down than the physical walls. We definitely need to take this seriously. To break down the walls in our minds 
that separate us from others. We need to recognize each other's common humanity and empathize with each other's basic human needs. But this does not mean we give up our identity as to who we are. In fact, we can only recognize the other if we are secure in our own identity. All right, but these mental walls should not be confused with physical walls. I will end my talk on a somewhat counterintuitive note, although one of our previous speakers said something similar. It's not the physical walls that are the enemy of human freedom, but the walls in our head, the walls of hatred that do not allow us to recognize our common humanity. The physical wall, in fact, under circumstance, certain circumstances can be a good thing. We say that good fences make good neighbors. A wall does not have to be something that locks people in or jails people. It can protect people, as, the pur as was the purpose of the Great Wall of China and the medieval European town walls. It can provide privacy for people, which is something essential to freedom. And by delineating a property line, it can make it clear to you and your neighbor how far your rights go and where their rights begin. When we say we want a world without walls, I think we, want, we mean that we want an open world where all nations recognize the right to exist in freedom of all other nations, where everyone is safe and secure and doesn't need a wall to protect themselves against a neighbor who wishes to harm them. When these mental walls of hate are broken down, then there will be no need for physical walls. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.